But uh, my name's uh, Bob Westervelt. I'm the director of the Science and Technology Center for Integrated uh, Quantum Materials. Uh, and uh, this SDC has organized this seminar series uh, to uh, talk about that topic. Um, the SDC's uh, joint operation between Harvard, uh, Howard University in DC, uh, and MIT, and we work with Carolyn Alpert at the Museum of Science uh, to do public outreach and get small kids uh, excited in, in science. We have a, a website which is actually has a ton of material on it, which is uh, sicum, C -I -Q -M .edu. And in particular, the website home uh, page, uh, Harvard is being generous this year, and we're going to put tapes of the uh, course lectures that we have here that are available on YouTube, which is, works wonderfully well and is available to absolutely everybody. And there's a link to YouTube on the course website, so if you want to catch a lecture that you missed, uh, you can see it right there. Um, so let me uh, get going. Um, what we've done with this uh, series to make it a straight graduate uh, seminar series, uh, almost period. Uh, and so we have both speakers that we select from inside the center to talk about what they're doing, uh, but then also to have leading outside speakers to come in here to tell you about uh, things that are related. And uh, this is a almost a complete set of uh, speakers for the fall. Uh, Philip Kim uh, will give the uh, talk uh, next week. And uh, aside from being famous in its own right, uh, Philip is the head of the layered uh, atomic materials uh, thrust in the uh, center, and he'll be talking a bit about that. Uh, and then we have uh, Sagar, my own postdoc, uh, and then uh, a series of fairly well-known speakers uh, like James Hone, for example, Columbia University, and from different universities will be uh, visiting us to speak uh, during the seminar uh, series. And we'll also set up uh, meetings for the outsiders uh, during the day so they'll have a chance to talk with the people inside the center. Uh, a bit more organizational uh, information. Actually, maybe I can do the Frank Sinatra routine like this and become blissfully happy when I'm sitting down. <laughs> Is this, can you still see me okay? Is, am I... Uh, Maybe not from, it's good. Okay, um, and so this is both uh, an open seminar series where you can come to whichever talks that you like or not go or whatever, just like any other seminar series. Uh, and we mix speakers from inside and outside the center, so it's very much like any others. Uh, but you can also get course credit through it through Engineering Sciences uh, 294 and to do that, uh, it's a pass-fail course, and there's no homework assignments or whatever. Uh, but in order to get credit, then you need to attend uh, uh, essentially all of the seminars. I mean, if you have a conflict or get the flu or whatnot, the usual problems, that's fine. I mean, it's not fine, but you know, you're excused. Uh, and, uh, but for, since there's only one lecture a week, then you need to do that for two terms, and you get a whole half course of credit. And I think, uh, We've designed this so you're getting sort of a broad cross-section of quantum materials and devices, but from some of the best people, and it can be quite interesting. I, I, I think it's a good experience, and if you would like to do that, um, then we'll have you sign up at the end of the class today. And, and Naomi, wherever you are, please bring me a piece of paper because I forgot. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I can't do that, can I? I'll try this. Ouch. So um, what's the vision of the center? This gives a, a timeline that sort of starts when I was uh, born right here. And so I've actually experienced this uh, whole thing. And uh, silicon came along in about 1955 and is really the basis for uh, what we've seen happen, which is an enormous uh, growth in computing power, sensing, communication uh, over the past 50 or 60 years. And to give a sense, I, I got some old pictures. This is, was very exciting back when I was in Schenectady, New York, about 1960. And it's a transistor radio with about four transistors in it, okay. And it costs about the same as an iPod 
interesting when you multiply by 10 to uh, change for the inflation. And then we, the first microprocessors, computers, cell phones, uh, up to my beautiful uh, air computer right here. The thing that's, um, well, let me show you some more pictures about this. I actually found a nice picture of a vacuum tube uh, computer. It turned out this doesn't work very well at all because the vacuum tubes blow out, as we old timers know, and uh, then the computer stops working and you've got problems. And so that was solved by the Nobel Prize winners here who invented the transistor at Bell Labs. The transistors don't go bad and it really fundamentally changes the story. And we've uh, progressed up to the point where you can have a microprocessor that has a speed of about a gigahertz uh, and you have uh, chips that have about a billion transistors on a chip, which is really truly uh, remarkable. The amazing thing, though, is that there's a fundamental change that happened about 10 years ago. It turns out you can't, as it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, you get more and more transistors on a chip. But at some point, you start headed toward the size of an atom, which is a different story. And it turns out that the oxide in silicon starts leaking. And for that reason, about 10 years ago, they stopped uh, following the regular rules. And as a result, the computers all have the same speed now. They're all about a gigahertz. If you look at the future uh, predictions, they'll be a gigahertz forever, more or less. Uh, and so if you want to make something that's very powerful, you have to put a lot of processors together, as shown here. Another problem that you get is that with the wires so long, you don't have the energy to drive the amount of uh, memory that you would like. And so if you're Google, this is perfectly good. They're right in the right territory. But if you want to do some hard, hydrodynamic problem or something like that, you're in deep trouble. And so that's a fundamental change that is not going to go away. And we're essentially stuck in the future with the uh, exascale that's 10 to the 18 as being a billion uh, airs connected by the website, which I mean by the internet, which is about where we are now. So we just shake hands with the Chinese and the Europeans and uh, all compute some problem. We can see what the, the difficulties are about get everything to work at the same time. Well, about 10 years ago, a uh, big change happened is it became possible to have materials that are atomic size but work perfectly well, that there's no problems. Uh, these things like graphene, transition metal dichalcogenides, color centers, uh, they have very high speed because they're so small. And the quantum mechanics, instead of being a bad thing in regular electronics, becomes a good thing because it's a quantum device and it saves quantum information and does quantum communication and really flips over into a new regime. And that's really what we're interested in pursuing. And so we're looking at three ranges of materials as shown here. There is the atomic layers like graphene, uh, boron nitride is sort of a cousin, uh, moly disulfide. Uh, these are good for making atomic scale devices. They're just one atom or one molecule thick. And if you're sufficiently clever, you can make them not so many uh, atoms wide. Now, show you some pictures. The amazing thing about graphene is that the band structure for graphene was done before I was born and is totally correct. Okay. And you yourself can solve this as a homework problem in your quantum mechanics course. But nobody made it. And first it was predicted that it was thermodynamically unstable that would uh, explode sort of if, if you only had one layer of atoms. In fact, it has record strength and it's one of the toughest materials in the world. Uh, and then nobody knew how to get it. And it was Geim actually figured if you take a piece of scotch tape and a, a crystal of graphene and you go whoop, and then you uh, peel off a bit of it and you go pango, pango, pango like this to make it thinner, that you can actually get down to a single layer and everything is perfectly good. And for that, you know, he's a very bright guy on top of this, and then he managed to get the uh, Nobel Prize along the, the velocity. Um, boron nitride is a similar material, moly disulfide too. It's interesting that their use before that was in high temperature lubricants because they flake and slide and do this, and you can actually buy spray cans of all three materials to actually make your car run better or your jet engine. One that's uh, even stranger, and I'll explain this a bit later, is topological insulators. 
These have edge states that, like quantum Hall edge states that go around their edge, even in zero applied magnetic fields. And like you can't stop an edge state in the quantum Hall effect. Likewise, once you send spin information around the topological insulator, you can't interrupt it because of the topology. I'll try to explain that to you later. And so the first ones are like atomic CO wire uh, devices. The topological insulators are like uh, wires. And the final thing you need is memory. And again, about 10 years ago, uh, diamonds are well known by uh, most people. Actually, I went to a Cartier a diamond exhibit in a museum. And if you get a chance to go, just go. There must have been tens of millions of dollars and maybe hundreds of millions of dollars of diamonds. And if you're a thief, there was only one guard at the front. And there were so many diamonds that you're looking at diamond headdresses and, you know, diamond necklaces that are this broad. And the amount of glitter and light coming off this stuff is, you know, truly astounding. So uh, diamonds have been popular for a long time, but it turns out they have color centers, as shown here. And a color center is just one atom that's the wrong type in the diamond. And it turns out that it works like a beautiful memory site for at least a millisecond or so. And so this really created a lot of attention. So I'm, I'll tell you a bit uh, more about these materials. And actually, a good way to do it, if you have any questions that you have or you want me to, even if it's not directly related to what I'm saying, you know, just go ahead. Are any questions so far? No? Good? All right. So let me start talking about uh, graphene and other atomically thin things. And there's a group of people working on this is uh, shown here. And uh, graphene was the first one to be uh, realized to be important. Uh, it uh, conducts uh, always. It's always on like a semi-metal. But its uh, neighbor is uh, hexagonal boron nitride, which has the same structure, but it's an insulator. And then transition metal dichalcogenides, like molydisulfide, can be uh, optoelectronics and uh, regular conductors. We'll tell you more about it. And so graphene, you get uh, particles that move like they're ultra relativistic speed, all at the same speed. Uh, hexagonal boron nitride is an extremely thin insulator, would suffice. And then molydisulfide gives you regular semiconductors. There's a, a big change that happens by making things so thin, and I'll try to show it here, uh, that I've previously worked on gallium arsenide in 3,5 quantum wells. And these things became, started to be hot at about 1971. And with the molecular beam epitaxy, you can grow uh, things one atomic layer at a time. It turns out in gallium arsenide, you can go down to about 10 nanometers, and then the roughness sort of kills the virtue of it. And so people did a lot of work on structures uh, that are about 10 nanometers thick. And you can say, well, what, uh, what energy does that correspond to? And you could just use Heisinger's uncertainty principle, which is nice. You know what delta Z is. Delta Z delta P is H bar. You've got delta P, then you square it and divide it by 2M, and you've got the energy. And when you do that, it turns out to be about 4 degrees Kelvin. And so that means that you have to do experiments in a delusion refrigerator at a place like Harvard or MIT, and that your apparatus costs $50,000, and it's mostly not big money because you can't do this. But if you do the same thing in like molydisulfide, and it's the picture here, then it's about one nanometer thick, actually it's about 0.6 nanometer. And this comes in squared. Uh, and so it means you can do things at room temperature. And so you see quantum effects just like we are here. And your expenses, expensive apparatus goes away. Life is good. We all become rich at some time in the future, I hope. And uh, it really changes uh, the game. And. Uh, this is a picture of, uh, in the Nobel Museum of the Scotch tape uh, trick that I've told you. Uh, it's amazing, but still true, that the best quality uh, materials of this, not only does graphene, but boron nitride and molydisulfide are still made with Scotch tape. And so it's good because you can take undergraduates and have them make champion samples. 
in Geim's lab, they gave prize, which is about the si price of a new car, for the largest flake that uh, anybody achieved. And so the students were going like this for a really long time. But with uh, patience and skill and some artistry, you can do very well. Uh, people like Jing Kong at MIT are developing ways to, you know, deterministic grain grow large areas using CVD. But that's a hot topic, but it, it's amazingly, it's still sort of an apprenticeship in order to get into the business. This is a picture of what the structure of graphene looks like. It's a hexagonal structure, and it turns out the uh, basis for hexagonal structure has two atoms in it, which are A and B. You can calculate the energy using a tight binding model, which is a standard graduate quantum mechanics story. And when you do that for just a row of atoms, you get a sine wave. This is energy versus momentum. So you can see there's a sine wave going there. When you do it for two atoms, you get two sine waves. And when you put the symmetry in, you get a band structure that's shown like this. The very unusual thing is that if you look close in to where these two bands uh, cross, uh, that it looks like photons in some ways that everything, the energy and momentum, is uh, traveling at the same speed. It's like all photons go to at the speed of light. They go in different directions, but they don't slow down. So that's the way the electrons are in graphene. The other very weird thing is that there's no band gap. If you have silicon or gallium arsenide, there's a range of energy where there's no, uh, no states at all, and that's fundamental to the way we think about it. But in graphene, it's just not there. So this is like I'm an old semiconductor, very old because I feel crippled at this point, but uh, old semiconductor guy. Uh, and this was really very different, and it takes a while to sort of figure it out. Interesting enough, graphene also shows the quantum Hall effect at room temperature, even fractional quantum Hall effect. Uh, and that's a consequence of being so small. There's uh, interesting uh, tricks you can do it. Uh, Wei Li Wang who worked with Tim Kaxiris and me as a postdoc, uh, used a high-resolution electron microscope to actually image these things. It turns out from the Museum of Science, more than half the people in the U.S. don't believe that atoms exist. They believe something else exists, but I'm not sure what, but, but not atoms. But in this case, you can see the atoms. And in this case, you're looking at a single silicon atom. Turns out silicon is sort of the dirt inside the microscope that's sitting right here, and that's their theory of it. And along the edge, they like to sort of match up to f make these pentagons like that, uh, and also to match in different ways. And you can do that, see what you've got just by taking a picture. Well, there's another question that, of course, people are working on, is how would you actually uh, carve out something it's an it's a atom thick, but how do you make something that's five atoms by seven atoms? Which, you know, and how do you contact and all of this, which is sort of the live game. And they were able to show that the uh, silicon atoms actually act as chisels. Uh, think about it where you have, in this case, a number of silicon atoms, which are shown here. There's a six angstrom hole that they blew into the uh, suspended graphene. And what the, in a movie of it, the silicons are just going around the outside gobbling up uh, carbons, which are then blown off to the outside. I think if you do uh, satisfy energy and momentum conservation, you can actually work out how this would go. And so they race around the inside like that, goes, same hole goes up to 12, uh, 16, and 21 angstroms like, like this. Of course, you just need a little genie it's an atom-sized genie that puts a silicon atom in the right place, and uh, when it's good. But there's another thing that you can see, is that it turns out graphene is enormously strong material in terms you can stretch it 20 percent, and it won't break. And how many things are like that? And so this makes it very attractive to companies like Intel, because you can imagine actually having a process that that worth won't sort of rip up the material as you go. But it turns out you can actually make a molecular wire, which is sort of a sci-fi object, uh, that consists of just a string of carbons that are bond one to the other. 
And it turns out this is also extremely strong. And uh, Whaley, uh, in looking at the uh, electron microscope, actually saw a couple of them. They're shown here. And let me show you a movie of these things. And remember this being blasted by 80, ME, 80 keV uh, electrons the whole time. And it just sort of dices around and doesn't go away, at least for a while. So here we go. And you can see it popping away like that and then finally pops. And so it's enormously strong uh, wire of uh, material. I'll just pop this again so you can see it. And so a lot of the action now is how do you actually uh, grow with CVD or in some machine that Intel would want to buy uh, large areas of this, say on a 12-inch sheet, may or something like that. Uh, and then how can you cut it up to be, you know, truly small? The things that people make now are only about a micron or so, which is absolutely huge compared with uh, what you would think you can do. Make sense? Any questions? Or other? No? Okay. Um, the other things is, uh, this shows the growth of graphene. Um, this picture of uh, Jing Kong and Gary Harris down at Howard University. And uh, Jing Kong, and also with Tomas Palacios, has gotten to be extremely good about doing patterned growth uh, that mix up the uh, moly disulfide and other transition metal dichalcogenides with graphene. And they actually uh, had, for example, a picture of the mascot of uh, MIT that was actually grown in the right shape using this uh, technique. And she's one of the leading experts in how to actually make these things work. And uh, Tomas Palacios, he was trying to get money out of Samsung to support his efforts and his grad students. And they told him, and he says, unless you're doing CMOS, you know, like silicon transistors, this thing, we won't give you any money. And uh, so he actually developed a way to make integrated circuits out of uh, transition metal dyed chalcogenides with on-off ratios of more than 10 to the 5 that actually function like logic. And they're flexible, too, so it can be on your glasses or your uh, sandwich bag or whatever. And so that in the range of these uh, TMDs, then, uh, there's some near-term applications that can make sort of the Internet of Things, you know, sensors and sort of low-powered uh, logic, but it's on everything. It could be on your clothes, you know, your glasses, things that you, you wear. Okay. Uh, the next one is a real stumper. When I first heard about, heard about this, I had no idea what it means. And these are things that are called topological insulators. And I'm a, an experimentalist, and so I naturally think that all the important things are discovered experimentally by experimentalists. And then the theorists are supposed to understand what the great experimentalist did and then explain it. And a lot of time it happens that way. But these were really rationally uh, thought out by theorists, and the experimentalists had no idea what they were doing. And uh, I'll try to explain uh, the picture. Here, the first uh, topological insulator uh, was the quantum Hall effect, and probably most of you have heard of that, know something about the way this works. That was an experimental discovery back when I was younger, um, and uh, this shows a picture of original sample made out of silicon MOSFET. It's a two-dimensional electron gas. You make it really cold and put it in a very large magnetic field. Uh, it turns out that the Hall effect becomes quantized in units of h over e squared, as shown here, and that the longitudinal resistance at the same time goes to zero. It turns out what happens is the, magnet the electric and magnetic fields are just, excuse me, the current and the electric field are just at a perfect right angle, which is really weird. And um, this was almost, this in, was in fact predicted by Ando, who's a great theorist in Japan, but his advisor said, don't say the resistance goes to zero because the referee won't like that. Instead, say the resistance gets very small. And so Ando would have gotten a Nobel Prize, I think, if he hadn't listened to it as advisor and made that change. But uh, this has had a, a lot of excitement uh, since then. 
but um, its topological is shown here because you have a, let's see with my back whether I can do this, you have electrons in the middle of the sample go in cycloton orbits and so they go around like this and it turns out in the quantum hole effect they're trapped by dirt and they really can't go anywhere and conduct anything so they're an insulator. But the electrons, this is a challenge if I yelp, let me know. Electrons on the edge go like this but then they bump the edge and then they bump again and they start moving to the right. And uh, that's what's shown in the schematic here where you end up creating an edge state that goes around the edge of the sample like that. And the thing is it really can't turn around and go the other way. There's no way. I can be going this way with my eyes closed. I'm not, I'll, I'll probably crimp out at some point here. Uh, and I'll, I'll just go around that way around the room. And I don't need to know that there's a wall there because I'll automatically make the turn. I'll go around the back and I'll be back here after some period of time. And so it's topologically protected. There's, there's just no way that it can switch. And that's why it's so, such a strong effect. And good old uh, Bert Halperin is the one that figured that out. I remember talking with him at the time. He said, it's such a strong effect that it's got to be something really deep that that causes it and he's the guy that really made this work. And uh, this shows that if you, you know, bite an edge out of the sample, the uh, edge state still goes around. But to do this, you need uh, a doer, liquid helium, a strong magnet, you know, it's not, it's not trivial. Um, and, but this is a topological effect and I think you probably all know topology, but the idea is if you have a coffee cup, it has a hole right here, and if the coffee cup were made out of clay, you can reshape it however you want and you still got a hole. Okay, and that's a different topology than a baseball. And as a result of that, you have these edge states. Each one is a one-dimensional conductor, and the conductance of it is E squared over H, where those are fundamental constants, the charge of an electron squared divided by Planck's constant. And it's, uh, it's that simple. Actually, I heard before this, I heard a lot of really bad theory talks about the quantum Hall effect. Oh, no. But then with this, you can uh, explain it fairly quickly. What happens, uh, so what's, what's the change with topological insulators? Um, and this was, again, theoretically done by bright people. Um, it turns out there's something that's called the spin orbit effect, as you've probably all covered in quantum mechanics. And suppose that you have a nucleus like this with an electric field, and then there's an electron that's spinning around it. And uh, you can say, well, we have a current loop, which is the electron spinning around. It creates a magnetic field at the nucleus. And so you're actually coupling the orbital motion with the spin. But it also works the other way. If we were spitting, sitting on the electron spin, like we are on the Earth, we're going around the sun, uh, and then you look at the sun, the sun is actually going around the Earth, okay? And if the sun had a big charge, that would be a current loop that's putting a magnetic field on us. And that's the way the spin orbit works, is that the electron spin feels the magnetic field from the nucleus, uh, and so it sees a magnetic field even with no applied magnetic field. And well, normally people know that this works, but you get relatively small effect that the aficionados understand, but most people don't need to know about. But if you go to very heavy uh, atoms, then the electrons are close into the nucleus and they go at speeds that can go up to relativistic speeds actually, and this becomes a big deal. When it becomes bigger than the energy gap, it totally flips and then you get a topological insulator. And so the way a, a 2D topological insulator works in zero magnetic field is that if you have a spin up, then it's circulating clockwise around the material, where if you have a spin down, it's going counterclockwise. But you don't need any a apparatus at all. It could be sitting on my finger and then you've got these two edge states. Furthermore, the direction of the spin cannot flip because the edge state is associated, it's topologically uh, 
tide to be spin up that it's going around this way and the spin downs are going in the opposite direction. And so if you want to put data into spins, this is a way that you can actually use an uncorruptible spin channel uh, to take a spin from one place to another. Let me show you a, a picture uh, of how this works. And I apologize, I tried to find pictures of guys in red and blue pants and I, I didn't do it, but I was lucky enough to find these women here. But maybe I get a pair of red pants and I'll be in good shape. But uh, you can do it with the hand trick. Actually, I'm beginning to loose up a bit. And in the woman in the, the red suit, uh, shown here, and when the rule is that you have sort of a, a left and a right hand, and at least if you're standing up, you can't swap these. And this one's left, you could put L on it, but it would still be always left hand, this is the right hand. And this is like the spin direction, okay, you have spin up and spin down. And when you touch the wall with your left hand and then you move along, you have to go around the room in a clockwise direction. And again, just like the quantum Hall effect, I would just go scouting around the room like this, and I would always be going that way. Whereas in the blue, if you touch with your right hand, I've got to move this way. And it's really that simple. That's what sort of locks it in. And it's all tied up with the place that the magnetic field comes from. So does this make sense or? No? Okay. Good. And so Nugetic at, uh, at MIT is actually finding ways to actually use this so you can implement that feature. And this, of course, we always make nice graphics be on the cover of a journal, and I think you made it with this, but um, this shows a photon coming in with a particular spin, and this spin gets uh, picked up by an edge state, and then here's the edge state freeway where then the spin gets zapped off to another part of the, the sample. The topological insulators, they're the weirdest and sort of most far future of the, uh, the, it's sort of a new type of matter that was really not understood until that happened. And they're the, also currently the most future. Liang Fu is one of the original founders. At, he's at MIT now and he's finding other type of topological crystals that have different properties that have not seen before. And then we try to make them and understand. And uh, the final one is uh, diamond. And as I was saying, the diamonds are really, uh, everybody likes diamonds for different reasons. Um, we have a, actually a secret uh, thrift store that we go to that's held in a hangar in uh, Alameda where you can get jewelry really cheaply. And the people buying the jewelry are like really rock bottom jewelers. But we found out about this. And you get a pearl necklace. Pearls, by the way, if you pick it up, Take the pearl when they're not looking and rub your teeth like this. And it's sort of a bone and your teeth are bones and they sort of cooperate and it goes click, click, click. You feel it gritty. Then you've got pearl, okay. If it's glass and you go like that, it's just smooth and it's not good. So you have to go like this and they don't see you. But we got, um, from my wife, uh, we got actually a beautiful pearl necklaces which the jewelers didn't want. Um, uh, for like five dollars, you know, and they're really pearls and they're old and, you know, it's nice. So this is a really highly recommended jewelry. You won't go broke, you come out with good jewelry. So. Um, but they sell diamonds too, and so I started looking into these things. The ones that are, and they have different grades depending on the color, and blue is boron, and like the Hope Diamond in DC is blue, or light blue, and this is, it seemed really excellent. The ones that are sort of orange colored uh, have nitrogen in them. And this is, I think, an S-grade diamond, which is the cheapest, okay. But for our purpose, this is the best diamond. Let me show how it works. This is uh, nitrogen, is sort of this color. Boron's blue, hydrogen's violet. Uh, radiation, for some reason, I don't understand, turns them green, but you should step back because this is probably not where you'd be next to. Um, but what is the color center? Let me show you on the left. Um, this is the diamond lattice, what it looks like. And nitrogen is a bit bigger 
than a diamond. And so to fit in, you need to put a vacancy, a missing carbon atom there. And so there's a bound pair, which is this nitrogen vacancy uh, center. Uh, and if you shine light on it, uh, the spin of one of the light can be absorbed by, say, green light coming in, can be absorbed by the NV center. And so you've taken, and suppose you do it with very low intensity of light, you take one photon, put it on the NV center, and then it puts a polarized spin right there. The amazing thing is that will stay coherent for over three milliseconds at room temperature, okay? In the quantum dot business, like old timers like me used to work in gallium arsenide, you were trying to get something to be coherent to make a quantum computer uh, for a millisecond, and Mark Kastner did it back a while ago, but he had to cool it down a dilution refrigerator that cost $300,000 in the lab and all that. This one you can do it with apparatus that would about the size of this projector here and doesn't cost very much money. So it really changes uh, the game. You can read it out by uh, shining green light on, and then uh, orange light comes out, and by looking at the intensity, you can tell whether it's been up or it's been down. The thing that's really exciting is that if you do the quantum efficiency of that light being absorbed and emitted, if you can make that near 100%, you can have what's called quantum uh, communication. And I used to be in Berkeley in the old days, and it's a bit like I myself am pure, but there's people there that used to take LSD, and you can imagine that you're looking at a object. What do I have? Like my phone here. And the phone then morphs into a small kitten. And say, holy smokes, it's a small kitten. It used to be a phone. This must have been a bad day. And then it morphs back into being a phone because you perceive it to be a small kitten at one point, you see it be a phone at the other point. But at the same time, it is both a phone and a small kitten. That's quantum mechanics, okay? That's the way it works. It's not just been up or it's been down, it's both. And you have to allow it to be both in order to have it work. And so if you can make the uh, efficiency high, it's possible to actually do quantum uh, communication where you take a quantum state that's not resolved into spin up or spin down and actually transport that somewhere else. And to do that, Marco Lanchar here has become sort of an expert carpenter in single crystal uh, diamond. This is one of their first structures. These are little uh, nanowires uh, focused with the RIE machine and CNS, Harvard's uh, fab facility. Uh, and they did this by pattern little disks on the top. This is single crystal of diamond. And then you cut vertically down. And what happens is that you'll get, uh, here's one of these nanowires. If it has an NV center in it, then you read it out, it will be red. And if it doesn't, then it'll be dull like that. So in doing this, you're actually making a random access memory where the memory elements are single atoms and single spins where you can write and read it out. It's interesting, this project was first done by an undergraduate woman as a summer project, and uh, Marco thought he would see if it worked, and it worked. And so then they uh, sort of buffing it up and making it better. And this picture of uh, Marco, Bishalik, and Amir who work on these things. And uh, at Harvard is, uh, I think, is the leading school in this area uh, because we have so many people that are both theoretically and experimentally involved. In the Center for Nanoscale Systems, uh, we've also put a lot of money into facilities to cu cut up crystal diamond, which is not, you know, your ordinary nanofab uh, uh, idea. It's interesting, it comes from uh, Element 6, who is, uh, one of the world's largest diamond growers, and uh, they make it for windows, for high power lasers, something where you don't burn it up, and substrates to carry out heat. But they do it by CVD, and the interesting thing is about how big a diamond could you make. It just depends on the substrate. 
So if you had a diamond, I don't know where you get this diamond, but you had a diamond that was a square foot across, you can make a single crystal diamond that's a square foot across. It's good, except we don't have a diamond. <laughs> so it's, it's all limited by the substrate, not by the process itself. And they really like Marco because um, Marco knows things they don't. Uh, the, uh, I had dinner or lunch with one of the element six people and said, what's your project with uh, Marco on? And he looked at me like this. I said, okay, okay, <laughs> don't tell me. And it was ultra secret for element six. Then Marco told me later, anyway, it was fine. But uh, he can make uh, pretty fancy stuff. This is an optical resonator, the little holes pick the wavelength that's suspended over the substrate to couple the photons with the NV. Uh, another way to couple the NV is with strain. Uh, the NV feels the strain field, and then they can talk to other NVs via the strain. And so he's making these little resonators uh, that uh, operate uh, like this. And partly for fun or whatnot, they got really talented at carving up uh, diamond in 3D. These are uh, resonators where uh, it's a skipping mode that goes around the edge, makes a high Q optical resonator. This one, it looks like a bicycle wheel. I'm not totally sure why he did this. I think it's to couple uh, a mechanical mode with the optical mode. And they made these elaborate you know, springs that go in different directions and uh, another kind of a, a spring that, that goes like this. And we just uh, bought about a year ago a new uh, diamond RIE, which is nice and shiny and costs a million dollars in CNS to support this kind of uh, expertise. Any questions or no questions so far? Is it too, too easy? To, Um, what um, Marco would like to do is to make a, uh, a quantum cloud. We all know that there's a cloud out there that's run by various people like Amazon or Microsoft or whatnot where the computation is done somewhere else, but then you just talk over the internet, which is sort of like boring and too easy. But if you combine uh, actual uh, quantum computation uh, with quantum repeaters, and then if you have a quantum communication over, say, fiber optics, uh, and with this mode where the uh, electron spin turns into a photon, turns into an electron spin, they being the same thing, quantum mechanically, then you can actually uh, have a piece of quantum computer that exists somewhere that you're not, and then you can communicate it with it with something that would be about the size of the uh, air with a few of these NV centers in it. The interesting thing is you could have the other one actually be inside Russia uh, or somewhere else and communicate with it. And because it's all quantum mechanical all the time, nobody can know what you're doing. It only becomes known when you actually realize the answer. And so it takes you off into, you know, really a bit sci-fi and sort of other worldly uh, ways of, of thinking about things. There we go, that's symbolic anyway. So, uh, so what we're doing, I'll sort of sum up, summarize what the center is working on. Uh, I was talking about graphene and uh, atomic layer materials, and this is a nice picture of uh, graphene. Uh, and we have, by the way, in CNS uh, has now two, uh, T there's a STEM and a TEM that have resolution that's better than one angstrom. So you can really just image an atom, okay? You have to hold it there. Uh, and so you get a very simple picture. And we have a good pitch on getting one that has a resolution of 0.35 angstroms that I think is going to happen in about a year. Uh, so we have ways to look at them. We have uh, excellent ways to make uh, devices. This is out of Amir Jacobi's group for bilayer graphene with top and bottom gates, which is, must have been terrific difficult to make. There's ways of making fast devices. Dunny Ham with uh, plasmons. These things are flexible and you can sort of cut holes at, 
at atomic scale sizes. In tabulological insulators, um, you can, uh, these are at the stage where it's still a conceptual uh, scientific field where we, people are predicting different type of topological crystals and then we try to grow them. One, uh, Liang Fu uh, predicted and gave it to Joe Chikelsky at uh, who does MBE growth at uh, MIT and he grew it and he did some electrical measurements. Sorry, I should have a picture but I forgot to bring this one. Uh, and uh, to see whether it's right or not, but you can't tell on transport. So then he took it down into our stem and took a picture. And in the stem, you can see what atom is because some atoms are big and some are small, right? And you can see where all the atoms are. And then they looked at the crystal structure and then the stem picture. And they go, Bzz, put them on top of each other. And it was exact. And so he says, we actually did it. Uh, and it hadn't been uh, done before. The hot thing here is the Majorana fermions. Uh, turns out you can split an electron into two parts that are uh, complements to each other. Uh, and depending on who you talk to, this has already been discovered or not yet discovered. And so it's a, a very kind of contra I have friends who say both, and a uh, very controversial field. Somebody will get a Nobel Prize, and I guess the fighting is to figure out who, who that, that is. And finally, the NV centers uh, in diamond that I've showed you some of these uh, pictures. It turns out you can use this to also store information on uh, Mission Lucan figured out how to do this on nuclear spins that are nearby for a really long time so period. I am not, uh, well over a second, I'm not sure what the, the record is. And you can use them also as magnetic field uh, imagers. Here's a nanowire with an NV center in it. And then you can sense very tiny magnetic field. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's it. I'm showing a picture of the folks uh, that are involved and would be glad to get any questions. Thank you. Totally clear. You can ask me a mystical question or something that otherwise would make sense as to... Uh, I'm being the host now. <laughs> Good. Well, we have a, a great set of uh, talks coming up. Let me show you again. And Naomi, if you hear me, bring in a piece of paper, please. And uh, people who would like to, well, let me put it this way. If you're interested in signing up to take the course, uh, please send me an email at my email address is westervelt at the uh, Uh, okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs>